master's degree in physiology, biomechanics, and human nutrition. I've spent the past two decades competing in some of the most masochistic events on the planet, from seal fit Kokoro, Spartan Agoji, and the world's toughest mutter, to 13 Ironman triathlons, brutal bow hunts, adventure races, spearfishing, plant foraging, free diving, bodybuilding, and beyond. I combine this intense time in the trenches with a blend of ancestral wisdom and modern science, search the globe for the world's top experts in performance, fat loss, recovery, gut, hormones, brain, beauty, and brawn to deliver you this podcast. Everything you need to know to live an adventurous, joyful, and fulfilling life. My name is Ben Greenfield. Enjoy the ride. All right. The podcast that you're about to hear actually wasn't recorded by me. It was recorded by a a supervillain in a health clinic, a rogue podcasting recorder who actually caught me on mic for an hour while I was getting an IV, actually, at this wonderful, cutting-edge, anti-aging, longevity, and health management clinic in L.A., called Next Health. They're like this full-on next-generation health and wellness destination. You walk in there, it looks like something off the freaking deck of, of like a Star Trek ship. Not that I'm a Trekkie. But not only do they have like cryotherapy and infrared lights and saunas and these full-on lay-down beds, but they do... They do, I mean, the stuff you're going to hear about in today's show is mind-blowing. Like, they work with the Longevity Institute to do, like, these full-on executive panels, full-body scans, MRIs. Uh, They do stem cells. They do PRP. They do vitamin cocktails. They do, like, facial treatments. Um, They're like one of these, almost like a a big biohacking facility. But the, the way that they do things, like, they cover everything. They can do micronutrient testing, telomere testing, heavy metal testing, cardiac panels, metabolic profiles. And then they also do, of course, like their vitamin shots, their IV therapy, their hormone therapy. Uh, They have something called hair transplant and also next beauty if you want to change your face or your hair. Anyways, it's pretty cool. So if you go to the show notes for today's show at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash next health podcast, that's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash next health podcast. I've put together some really comprehensive show notes for you, some links over to some special goodies from Next Health that they're giving to all my listeners. Plenty over there. Just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Next Health Podcast. And the guy who you're going to hear interview me is a really great dude. Uh, his name is Dr. Uh, Darshan Shaw. He has a history, like his original upbringing was in Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, and then he's done like trauma surgery, general surgery, plastic reconstruction surgery and eventually created you know what is essentially like the apple store of health and wellness this next health facility uh and he's a, he's a very smart guy like he started training as a as an md when he was 15 years old and he was a doctor by the time he was 21 he's one of the youngest doctors in the u.s and he's a really great guy super smart uh and he lives with his family his two kids and his wife in Malibu. He's just a, he's a good dude. So uh, you're going to enjoy this episode, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash next health podcast. If you didn't hear already, or, uh, and, and especially if you haven't been living under a rock for the past few years, uh, you've probably heard of fasting and you may have in the past few days heard about the new fasting challenge that I'm leading uh, begins January 7th. So at the time this podcast comes out, freaking get on the ball because it starts in two days. What I'm doing is I put together a full fasting guide answers all these questions like you know does coffee break a fast what about supplements what kind of fasting is best how do you do fasting if you're working out a lot what fasting is good for longevity what fasting is good for fat loss so i've put together multiple kind of like choose your own adventure variations of like alternate day fasting intermittent fasting fasting mimicking diet liquid fast non-liquid fast Uh, and anyone can join me in this fasting challenge so i'm gonna fast from january 7th through the 11th and no matter what kind of fast you want to do like there's no special supplements you have to buy nothing like that totally free fasting challenge supported by me with live facebook q a's from me to be able to answer your questions uh you get to download this free guide i've got called fasting decoded and you get to join the entire community of listeners that's going to be doing this fast along with me so the big part of this is accountability and it's just going to be fun to reinvent our bodies and start off the new year on the right foot so Here's how to get in. You go to getkeon.com slash fast. That's getkion.com slash fast. That'll automatically get you in on the fast, on the the um, 
the book that I wrote, everything is over there. So get Keon, get K-I-O-N.com slash fast. I'll also put a link in the show notes for today's show, which again are at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash next health podcast. All right, let's do this. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Darshan Shah with the Next Health Forefront podcast. And we are so lucky today to have Mr. Ben Greenfield here, who is definitely on the forefront of everything health, wellness, biohacking. I've been trying to get Ben out here for a while now, so it's a real honor and pleasure. I made it. It's the second time here. Well, I mean, I've already had donuts (laughs) from across the hallway here here at Century City. I don't know what was in them, but they were from Sun Life Organics. Our good friend Khalil put some good stuff in uh, there. It said gluten-free, and they tasted like they probably had unicorn tears and... And some kind of rare superfood in them, so I feel I'm amazing. Sure. <laughs> I had, had those dipped in, in a little coffee, and uh, and I'm on an I- NAD drip IV right now. So between donuts and an IV, I feel pretty damn good. Fantastic! Yeah. We got yeah. you all revved up I, for I'm this podcast. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so it's also an incredible honor that you're here on the day before your birthday, mm-hmm. and you were just telling me your telomere age is actually twenty. So it's we'll 20. go with that. Yeah, we're we're actually. I know that's that's one test you guys do here, and we're gonna we're gonna. <laughs> We're going to see if I've gone down even more in the past year since the last time that I've tested. But yeah, I mean, that that's one of my passions is how can one using both kind of a little bit of ancestor wisdom and a little right. bit of, of modern technology and science or biohacking or whatever you want to call it, uh, optimize longevity. And, yeah. you know, of course, as you know, telomere analysis is not like necessarily an ironclad way to tell exactly how you're doing. But when you when you put that in with a cluster of other things that can mm-hmm. tell you how fast you're aging, such as grip strength Mm -hmm. and walking speed. And uh, there's one interesting study on the ability to be able to sit down and stand up from the floor. Oh, yes. And and then, of course, you pay attention to to your face and your inflammatory markers and your glycemic variability. And you can can kind of put together a cluster of things that you can test to track how well you're doing. Balance. um, Trying to be on this planet a longer time so that you can can better achieve your life's purpose. Yeah, exactly. I, I love it. You... You said it perfectly, and that's what Next Health is all about, improving your not just your chronological age, but how well and how healthy you are during that time. Oh, and yeah. And yeah. longevity markers are a huge um, topic that we test for here. And I like telomeres because, like it's, like you said, it's not the only end-all, be-all, but it's like kind of like a scorecard for me. I love seeing where I am year to year, you know? Exactly. That's what I like to do. So about, I've, I've been testing about every six months. And, you know, like the first time I did it, it was, right. it was, I was older uh, biologically than chronologically. I think I was 34 years old and I tested out at 37. Ooh, yeah. I'm turning 37 tomorrow. And the last time that I tested telomeres, I was 20. And so it's been, been decreasing significantly as I go down the road of, you know, speak of the devil, NAD and... Uh, I've been implementing more fasting protocols in a more structured way, and I've been paying a lot more attention to inflammatory markers, particularly with relevancy to exercise, and paying more attention to not just exercising for the sake of exercise, but using a minimal effective dose, and then scratching that itch to either move or improve one's body and brain with other things. Sauna, walks in the sunshine, cold playing the guitar, painting. I mean, like there are a lot of things, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of people who are just like, they feel like shit if they don't go out and do their CrossFit wad every day. And a big part of that is that we, we as humans, we crave improvement. You know, we crave variety. We crave improvement. We, we crave something we can do to, to make it feel as though we've somehow moved the dial on our lives each day or, or made ourselves better. And the problem is that in our, in our era, we have been, led to believe that the top of the totem pole for that is the workout when in fact there are so many other things that you can do and the reason i'm talking about this in in the context of longevity is you know data shows once you exceed like 60 minutes of intense exercise per day you get increased risk of mortality same thing with aerobic exercise like not like gardening and hiking but you know pounding the pavement for your lunchtime run or, Mm -hmm. or swimming laps in the pool or you know, charging your bike down the highway, something like that. Once you exceed 90 minutes of that, you get increased risk of mortality. And coming from a guy who, you know, I'm a former Ironman triathlete and did that for 10 years and, yeah. you know, and bodybuilding before that, you know, bodybuilding, that's two hours a day of inflammation and eccentric muscle tissue damage. Ironman triathlon is, I mean, sometimes three or four hours a day sure. on the weekends, just chronic cardio. And so 
that stuff absolutely adds up. And I think that one of the most profound discoveries that exercise enthusiasts can make is to open themselves up to the possibility that there are ways to scratch that dopamine itch and that urge for self-improvement with things that go beyond just, you know, dumbbell curls and, 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 and treadmills. No, yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting, the paradigm shifts that occur in the thinking of um, Americans and just the population in general, when we started to get fat about 50 years ago, the problem was that we had too many calories and we had to burn as many calories as possible. Therefore you run marathons. Therefore right. you work right. out all day. Right. And what's incredible to me is that we always seem to have like this all or none mentality. Like if, if either they're sedentary or you're, or yeah. you're doing a marathon, but really human beings are me- meant to live in homeostasis. Right. Right. And there's, exactly. it's like you said, the minimum effective dose is what we should be trying to figure out with all Min- of this. Well, minimum effective dose mm-hmm. of exercise. Really, I would say maximum effective dose of physical activity, right? Mm-hmm. Hacking your environment to be right. on a walking treadmill or a standing workstation and taking Pomodoro breaks to move mm-hmm. and getting out in the sunshine and you know defying that societal expectation to freaking sit whenever you're not doing it. Like you go to the airport and everyone's sitting there right. waiting to sit some more on the airplane. Uh, you know, and, and when I go to the airport, I'm I'm walking around. I'm do I do freaking jumping jacks or whatever gate I can find that's empty, mm-hmm. and I, like I, I completely avoid sitting there. <laughs> you know, you go to the chiro- This is the worst one. You go to the chiropractic, right? And and you're there at the chiropractic office, and everybody's just slunched over on their phones, waiting to get their back treated because of their shortened hip flexors that they right. got from sitting. But you know, when I go to the chiropractic, I'm stretching my hip flexors and my psoas and lunging and doing you know, halfway warrior yoga moves while I'm waiting to see the Cairo. And and so the idea is you figure out ways to inject low level physical activity in your life all day long so that you can have the minimum dose of exercise because there was a time when the gym, the box, the, the hard workout, you know, whatever you, you want to call it was relegated to the realm of athletes and gymnasts and warriors and gladiators and the average person was farming and gardening and fencing and lifting rocks and hunting and it would have been absolutely insane to finish a day and i I, when i was painting in college i was a painter Mm -hmm. i didn't finish a day of painting and have this intense urge to go to the gym for catharsis or to move i was exhausted i was ready to like sit around with my friends and like have a glass of wine and a nice (laughs) salad and some steak at the end of the day and I realized that sounds unfair to somebody who's sitting in a cubicle or maybe even, you know, like a you know, physician probably isn't a good analogy because I know a lot of doctors and they're just like up and down all day at their jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, someone who's who's basically relegated to a cubicle, this might sound unfair, but I mean, freaking A, you can have a kettlebell underneath your desk and stop every 25 minutes to do 30 kettlebell swings and you can take the stairs and and you can walk as much as possible and skip the hour lunch break to have a quick 15 minute salad and go for a 45 minute walk in the sunshine. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things that you can do that go beyond just, uh, frankly, increasing your risk of mortality by sitting all day, then creating rampant inflammation by beating yourself up at the beginning or the end of that day of sitting. Right, right. Absolutely. I think the best purchase I ever made in my life, I still say this, is my walking desk. Like that, that thing has changed my life literally. And yeah. I, I can, you know, I, I went from creating inflammation and creating basically a decrease in my longevity to flipping it. And I actually love doing it. It's a lot more fun. So yeah. I- inserting little things like that in your life, it's kind of simple, but you just got to get the motivation to do it and understand it really works. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say the best investment I ever made was probably a cannabis company up in Canada. <laughs> but if we're talking about <laughs> Probably there are other things I've made more money on than the treadmill workstation. But as far as from a health standpoint, um, yeah, I would agree with you. Probably, probably that would be up there. The pull up bar in the door of the office, my little, you know, collection of kettlebells and another one that I think is a very good investment for just about everybody. And this sounds uh, might even sound gimmicky, but it's a hex bar. A What's hex that? bar is a special kind of, of bar that allows you to do a deadlift, but it protects the back. It allows you to really utilize your glutes. It trains grip strength. It works just about every muscle in your body. 
So what I have is a hex bar loaded up with enough weight to where there's no way I could do more than five repetitions with it. And that's in the room next to my office. So when I finish a podcast or a consult call or, a, you know, an hour block of emails or whatever, I can walk in the room next to my office and just do a few reps of lifting heavy stuff. And your body has this really good anabolic response. And, and again, it's far different than me going to the gym and spending an hour at the gym doing whatever, a five by five deadlift protocol and, you know, sitting yeah. there playing candy crush in between each one or, you know, standing <laughs> slack jaw and watching right. the gym TV. But it's uh, you know, a hex bar is actually a very good investment as well. And there's some it. really interesting data on, on its ability to increase grip strength and also, uh, glute activation, which is one of the things that, you know, when you lose your glutes, your hip flexors are shortened at right. the same time, you begin to see increased risk of frailty, decreased exercise performance. Right. So yeah, the, the hex bar pull up kettlebell combo. I think if you're going to have anything and then we'd, we'd probably throw the walking treadmill or that some kind of a treadmill yeah. so you can move inside. Yeah. You, you get those things and, and you're, you're well onto your way of being able to engage in that whole idea of lift heavy stuff occasionally, sprint occasionally, move all day long as an alternative to exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't tell you how many patients I see that have low back pain and it's because yeah. their, their glutes are short and they don't, right. they don't even know it. And yeah. it's once I put them on a stretching protocol, it changes yeah. their life. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not their glutes. They're, uh, they're, uh, their hip flexors. I mean, their hip flexors. Hip flexors. Sorry, yeah. So ass, right. iliacus. Yeah. yeah. All of that, which, you know, for people listening, just, just from a pure biomechanical standpoint, as soon as you shorten one muscle, you can deactivate the ability exactly. of the, the co-contracting or the, the opposing muscle to be able to generate force. So if you sit all day, you essentially turn off your glutes and that's, right. that's why, you know, if, if you, if you go to the average mall and you, and the, this might sound like total creep factor, but maybe wear your, wear your sunglasses or your blue light blocking glasses and start to just look at people's asses. <laughs> right. And, and like we live in a culture where a lot of people, they just don't have asses. Right. right? And, right. and honestly, like if there's one muscle that you could train, it would be your ass yeah. squats, deadlifts, lunges, taking the stairs, mm-hmm. avoiding long periods of time spent sitting. Uh, the cool thing is that a lot of those leg muscles have a high proportion of androgen receptors as well. So when you train them and you move them, you upregulate your ability to be able to respond to some of the things that people come to a clinic like this to to optimize. You know, sure. things like testosterone and growth hormone. And right. So so yeah, working the legs and paying attention to the glutes is is super important. Yeah, which absolutely. is why you'll see me shifting constantly during this podcast. You'll notice, like I'm always just in a, <laughs> in a different position. I know right, I've already I've it. already like kicked you twice. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. It'll remind me every time you cook me to move too. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Love it. So since we're on the topic of exercise, and for those of you who are clients of Next Health and members, you know that we talk about 12 different aspects of health, and we call that our wellness wheel. And I kind of showed you a graphic of that that we have over here as well. Um, And exercise is one of those 12 different aspects that we coach people on. I want to get your opinion on high intensity intermittent training hit exercises. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on them? And do you use it? What's your thoughts? So HIT training, uh, H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training, when you look at the data on it, uh, essentially there are two different ways to increase your mitochondrial density. Both ways work. One is via long and slow, relatively aerobic training where you're well below what would be considered to be your lactic acid threshold, where your muscles are beginning to produce lactic acid faster than it can be removed. So we're talking about exercising close to, uh, if you, if you were to go to an exercise physiology lab and wear a mask during exercise, it would be like the point at which you're burning the most amount of fat. That that's an approximation of your aerobic intensity. And that pathway can stimulate mitochondrial density, but it takes long periods of time spent exercising. We see that a lot of the world's best endurance athletes use that type of protocol with very brief periods of time spent doing intense training. It's called a polarized training approach, but it, only seems to work to really move the dial on improving mitochondrial density and aerobic fitness as a whole. When you have a lot of time to do it, you got to exercise a lot. You got to, it's got to be like be your job and you know, you're going on a two hour hike and an hour long bike ride every day and pretty low level physical intensity, but it works. And then the other way uh, is, is via a different pathway that increases mitochondrial density and fitness and capillarization in response to higher intensity brief spurts of exercise. 
Uh, examples of that would be we know that you can significantly increase mitochondrial density with just one to two times a week for 30 second extremely hard efforts with four minutes of recovery in between each so that's a one to eight work to rest ratio but that actually is something that's been studied and been shown to be a very good protocol for increasing mitochondrial density so you get on a bike 30 seconds just freaking balls out and then four minutes off or, or active recovery or like easy pedaling and you just do that four times boom done um, another example would be, you know, it, and if you, if you were like, well, I don't want to do like the whole formal exercise thing. I, I really, really want to go out natural, you know, you could say, well, go, go play soccer a couple times a week. And you know, you're, you got brief sprints with, with little bits of jogging and walking in between each good example or tennis. Um, we also know, for example, that when it comes to lactic acid tolerance or building up a lot of lactic acid in the muscle, which does induce a testosterone and growth hormone response that a very simple, and this would be another example of high intensity interval training, four minute, what's called a Tabata set, named after the Japanese researcher that did this, Tabata. And that's 20 seconds, very hard, 10 seconds easy. But that's just four minutes, like eight times through, four, four minutes of 20 seconds on. Four minutes seconds total off, for the workout. Four minutes total. But by the time you warm up and cool down, it's probably closer to like 10 minutes yeah. by the time that you're done. But yeah, that's another example. In addition to the 30 seconds on, four minutes off. And then one final example, you know, so, so, that's an example of how to increase mitochondrial density. And then that second example I gave was how you could increase your lactic acid tolerance for the hormonal response. And then finally, when we talk about longevity markers, uh, maximum oxygen utilization or VO2 sure. max is another thing that's correlated with longevity, performance, uh, et cetera. And that responds very well to longer intense interval sessions. But again, not a super long session when you put it all, all into context. And that would be four minutes at your maximum sustainable pace, mm. followed by a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. So like four minutes of recovery. So what I'll have some of the people I train do is once a week, they'll do four minutes as hard as they can go, four minutes easy, four times through, right? So you're still exercising for less than a half hour. And that, that's probably the more painful of the three examples that I gave in, in terms of, of discomfort. But those would be ways that you could use high intensity interval training as a way to increase mitochondrial density lactic acid tolerance and VO2 max and lest people be asking now the question, well, I thought you said that exercise is bad or that intense exercise is unnecessary. What I'm saying is that you, you are still, unless you are that construction worker, farmer, hunter, gatherer, gardener, whatever, even if you kind of hacked your environment to have that standing workstation, treadmill workstation, stopping for Pomodoro breaks every once in a while, uh, in a post-industrial era, we are still largely sedentary. You know, we're sitting in cars, trains, subways, etc. So I think that occasionally, less than most people think is necessary, um, you know, what I just named would be maybe an hour and a half to two hours of your entire week, right? So, so that would be an example of a scenario that would be more conducive to longevity with that minimal effective dose of exercise. You're still missing out on strength, but then once you throw in and this is another thing I have a lot of my clients do just like two single set to failure sessions. Like there's a book by Doug McGuff called body by science where he says, okay, so chest press, pull down, shoulder press, press, seated row, leg press, one single set to failure for each of those. And your body responds very well to that from a strength training standpoint, it takes 12 to 18 minutes and you can do that on like a Monday and a Friday. And sure, if you're training for a Spartan or a triathlon or the CrossFit games, and that's your dragon to slay, that's the Mount Everest you want to climb, don't fool yourself that those type of activities will make you live longer, but they can be fun, right? They can make life fun. And so if you're doing those type of things, sure, you probably need to do more than like sitting there doing a chest press to fail. You probably got to do some push-ups and some bear crawls and some, some rock carries and all sorts of stuff. But uh, ultimately, for the average person who's not wanting to go out there and be a competitive athlete, you know, those brief high intensity interval training sessions with a couple of, of strength training sets where you're, where you're just doing one single set to failure and low level physical activity at your job during the day. And you're covering all of those bases from an yeah. exercise standpoint. That's perfect. And it's such fantastic advice, especially for people in today's era where like, you know, no one really has time and they're trying to fit exercise into like an already very busy schedule in a sedentary life, putting in some high intensity interval training, doing a little bit of strength workouts and trying to work it in as much as possible in your life. It's a good moral to the story. Doing that yeah. is is going to at least keep you at um, at a place where you're increasing your longevity, not decreasing it by not doing anything. Yep. Right. Exactly. I love it. 
So let's move back. Let's talk a little bit about what diet you're on now. So what's the uh, Ben Greenfield diet at this point in time? My diet widely varies based on due to my extensive international travel where I happen to be in the world. I am a foodie. I love to eat whatever local, good, whole food cuisine happens to be in the area that I'm in. If I'm in Japan, I'm eating rice and fish and seaweed and, you know, the herbs and spices they have over there, like, you know, bitter melon extract or, you know, miso or anything like that. When I am in, you know, like, a, uh, you know, Iceland or Finland, I'm doing tons of fish, cold water fish, uh, you know, reindeer, bilberries, lingonberries, sea buckthorn, you know, and what they eat over there. When I'm at home, the closest approximation to what I eat would be something like the Weston A. Price diet. Unlike the paleo diet, I don't feel that we need to eliminate dairy and grains. I feel that if they're fermented and soaked and sprouted and a lot of the anti-nutrients are deactivated and they're made digestible and you're eating things like slow fermented sourdough bread and raw milk and yogurt and accompanying that with good fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi grass-fed meat, cold water fish, uh, you know, butter, uh, olive oil, a high intake of wild plants that you cover a lot of your bases. Now, I, I don't think that there is one perfect human diet, but what I think is that for the average person who's trying to, to eat healthy, sometimes eating healthy occurs in phases, meaning many people have leaky guts or damaged guts they might need to follow a relatively restrictive diet that does eliminate some plant lectins or they have joint pain and they need to eliminate nightshades until they've fixed any type of chronic inflammatory response syndrome or immune system issue that they have. They may need to follow a, 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 you know, a gut and psychology syndrome GAPS diet or a specific carbohydrate diet if they have SIBO or FODMAP sensitivities, bloating and gas, uh, or they may need to follow like a paleo autoimmune diet but the idea is that any restrictive diet, including even a carnivore diet, which is, in my opinion, a food elimination diet that people feel good on because they've gotten rid of a lot of, you know, a lot of things that yeah. could present uh, an inflammatory response in the gut. Soy, wheat, dairy, you know, a lot of fast food, et cetera, even, even plants to a certain extent with people who have gut issues, you, your body just has difficulty with the natural defense mechanisms present in plants. However... Once you've followed a more restrictive diet or a food elimination diet or gotten rid of the aggravating foods for you for a certain period of time, a lot of times that's two to six months, mm -hmm. you can begin to engage in more dietary variety. You know, you, you can try some, some good raw yogurt or goat's milk. And even if you haven't been having dairy for a while, once you've healed your gut and your intestinal villi that produce some of that lactase for you to digest the lactose sugars, everything's restored and you're able to handle a little bit better. Uh, the same thing could be said for, um, for example, uh, let's say that you aren't eating bread or gluten at all. You've completely eliminated them, but then you've used things like bone broth and glutamine and colostrum and a really nourishing diet for the gut. You no longer have any type of, of IBD or IBS. Well, maybe you can start having quinoa and amaranth and millet and overnight oats and you know a fermented sourdough bread and some of these less dense sources of gluten so in my opinion and, and what i eat it's a whole foods diet consisting of you know every good thing that grows on the planet but then there's variety i eat you know and i eat seasonally yeah we, we and we see these things no matter what diet you know when you look at all these blue zones or longevity hotspots sure. there are specific characteristics we yep. see uh you, you you eat seasonally you eat locally. You eat real food. There's a lot of plant intake. You have certain periods of time where you're caloric restricting or fasting, whether for religious reasons or otherwise. And that could be an intermittent fast. It could be an alternate day fast. It could be a fasting mimicking diet. It could be, you know, you've got, you know, like my dad, you know, after Thanksgiving meal, he was just like, I'm not eating meat till Christmas because that's, he's, you know, he's, he's a, uh, Eastern Orthodox. And so that's his religion, no meat till Christmas. So, you know, that's a period of time where he's, engaging in cellular autophagy and inhibiting the mTOR pathway. And, you know, it's more for religious reasons than, than right. for biochemical reasons, but the biochemical reasons are kind of the, the concept or the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the favorable side effect of that. So that's the way that, that I eat. And I think that it varies for everyone, but if I could give one solid 
piece of advice to folks, it would be to, especially if you've done like genetic testing or blood testing or salivary or urine or stool testing, that you eat a as whole foods a diet as you can eat and then use all of your self-quantification data to tweak it to you, right? right. So what I mean by that is, well, let, let's, let's give one really quick example. You're a Northern European and you know that your ancestors had a lot of like cold water fish and omega-3 fatty acids and minerals from salting and fermenting and curing and pickling in their diets. You're going to eat a lot of really good mineral rich foods. You're going to use like a Celtic sea salt. You're going to eat a lot of cold water fish and some grass fed beef. You're probably not going to do a lot of fruit because your ancestors wouldn't have access to that much. And you are going to include a lot of wild plants, particularly ferments like sauerkraut and kimchi, and then based on your blood results that might show whatever, low vitamin D, low magnesium, and uh, high inflammation. So you're going to take vitamin D, you're going to take magnesium, and you're going to throw some kind of curcumin complex in there, yeah. right? And, and so that's an example of just taking right. your ancestral data, your blood data, whole foods approach, and tweaking everything to you. I love it. Yeah, and, and that's what we talk about here all the time. I, I like to use a protocol where we personalize every single diet because we all know there's no one diet that's right for everybody. And we measure hemoglobin A1C and glucose response as part of that. So if there's a glucose response issue, we treat that with a low carb, obviously sugar elimination diet, maybe some metformin. We do food sensitivity testing. I feel like that's kind of a way to shortcut and know what foods eliminate first on like an elimination diet. And then genetic testing because I believe that, you know, epigenetically our genes change constantly and We've had hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that have modified our genes based on what our um, ancestry is, basically. So we kind of put that together for people. It sounds like that's kind of like what you're doing, basically, right? Yeah. One question that I have for you based on that, are you implying that you are testing genetics throughout the year, like more than once? No, Because of once. epigenetics? Okay, so you're testing. You're not saying that people... I doubt you guys are doing CRISPR technology and changing no. people's genes not throughout yet. the year. So no, you're saying what you're saying is <laughs> yeah. that it's necessary for people to do a genetic test once, like in a lifetime, exactly. to just have all their SNPs. Yeah. Well, hello. I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about my friend, uh, Drew Canoli. Uh, seven years ago, Drew was working a job he hated. He ate fast food every day. He drank coffee and energy drinks just to stay awake at work. Uh, and then one of his buddies introduced him to green superfoods, and he started doing wheatgrass shots and moringa and spirulina and all these different dense green things to boost his immunity and to burn fat and to detox and to not have to spend like 20 bucks at the juice bar every day, he just decided to start making his own blends. And his green juice blend that he's come up with, which is coconut and ashwagandha infused, tastes amazing. And it allows you to make a green juice for pennies on the dollar. Uh, that and, and his sourcing is just incredible. The dude is extremely anal when it comes to making sure nothing is like pesticide, herbicide. It's all USDA organic, gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, soy-free everything. So you get 20% off of his green juices. You just go to Organifi.com. That's spelled with an I. Organifi.com. And the discount code you can use for 20% is Greenfield. So that's Organifi.com and use code Greenfield. And the reason for that, the reason I mentioned epigenetics is because our genes change as, uh, as we evolve because of epigenetics. So like you said, whatever, whatever ancestry area of the world you were raised in, what happened was those, your, your ancestors basically had access to certain types of food. And because of evolution, those foods affected their genes and then they evolved into the survival of the fittest, basically. And the, that's what's the fittest for your ancestry. Yes. And some of those food practices wound up being implemented because certain tribes or populations discovered that those foods reduced their susceptibility to dying early because of genetic risk, which is why uh, folks in Cameroon, Africa, really need a higher fiber diet because they have a higher than normal genetic risk for colon cancer. Exactly. And in that context of a fiber-rich diet in Africa, they do not get colon cancer. But then once you put someone like that in the deep south eating, and I know this sounds stereotypical, but I'm just going to roll with it anyways, eating you know fried chicken and fast food you know in the absence of of high plant and fiber intake all of a sudden that same population gets colon cancer or you could say the same thing for you know a hispanic population that has a higher than normal risk for type 2 diabetes 
but that's controlled with a low glycemic index legume and fiber rich diet as you would find in the context of say the the tar muhar indian tribe right and then you take that same hispanic population and you put them into the context of taco bell and taco time and corn chips and refried beans and a lot of these bastardizations of traditional mexican cuisine and you have a hispanic population in america getting a high rate of diabetes. Right. And so, yeah, if, if you are, if you're lucky enough to not be a mutt like me, right, and, <laughs> and be, be like purebred and, and kind of really know that the majority of your ancestry, man, one of the smartest things you can do is look at what your ancestors were eating in their exactly. environmental context, you know, 100 or 200 or 1,000 years ago, because you know, based on what you've just explained, Dr. Shaw, the epigenetics of this dictate that you're probably going to respond pretty favorably to that diet. Right, absolutely. And, and, you know, we have the science now, and I think we've gone through, like, this century of all these diets, where, you know, whether it's the food pyramid that's prescribed down to us or, you know, those Atkins, and everyone thought their diet was supposed to be Atkins, and that's how they're going to lose weight. I think we know now that there's not one diet that's right for everybody, and kind of taking a more global approach to it, incorporating genetics, some testing, and really sticking to like like you said, like you know, whole foods from your region that's local is going to be what's going to win all the time, and the most sustainable too, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk about on the subject of gut health. Where have you kind of fallen with all this microbiome stuff? We've talked about that before. Um, I know you know we test microbiome on people. Um, I just want to know what your what your feeling is about the science right now, and if you're incorporated that in your daily life. Well. Look, what we do know is that the biome of the large intestine, which is largely what you're looking at when you do a stool analysis, is not necessarily reflective of the biome of the small intestine. Therefore, you cannot say, since XYZ bacteria is deficient in your stool sample, that you are therefore deficient in this particular bacteria and would benefit from taking XYZ probiotic. That's that's kind of kind of throwing darts in the dark. We're not sure now. All of these companies that are now testing the biome, the American Gut Project, and Viome, and U Biome, and it seems like there's a new one every day. They're collecting data, and and they could get to the point where they're really able to say, well, we have four thousand people who have tested with our company, and we have established that all the people who appear to have a a firmicide bacterioid ratio that is imbalanced based on their large intestine testing benefit from, let's say, this this blend of Saccharomyces polarity and and these eight lactobacillus compounds. And if they're able to say that based on the big data that they've collected, great. But we're not at that point yet. So, you know, but we do know is that probiotics, I'm not saying probiotics are useless, for some reason, even though recent studies have shown that probiotics do not seem to do a good job populating the gut, they, they pass pretty quickly through the body and many of them are damaged or destroyed in the process of the acidic environment of the stomach and the other digestive processes that they need to go through. For some reason, and people don't know why still, they have, they have an impact on IBS and IBD and, uh, and depression is another one. Like there are some mood disorders that respond favorably to probiotics, but we know so little about how they're working at this point. We still can't say your stool test says you don't have this specific bacteria. Therefore you should take it right there. There's just not enough data to say now. I think it is valuable to test your gut and get a full analysis of your microbiome because at least once research has progressed to the point where we can take actionable steps based on that data. And we know that, we can look at your bacterial profile or plug it into an algorithm and say, okay, not only do you need to take probiotics, but these are the eight foods that we've actually now shown from big data with your specific bacterial profile that you need to avoid, or these are the vitamins that you need to take, or these are the, these are the, the antihistamines that you need to take based on your bacterial profile. Great. But at this point, we're just kind of sitting on a pile of interesting but relatively useless data. Yeah, I totally agree with you. But what's really cool about it now is that it's kind of like this convergence of where computer technology is and the data collection is. Because now we have a ridiculous amount of data that, you know, I don't care what researcher you are, trying to put all this in a spreadsheet and find a pattern is going to take you years if not never happen. 
But we can plug this data into artificial intelligence systems now and use supercomputers to sort through all of it to yeah. give us some actionable insights. And that's where, like you said, you're basically contributing your data to these companies that are testing right now. And it's interesting stuff to look at. I think some people might find that they have, um, you know, maybe a pathogenic bacteria or some really bad imbalance, but you're not getting a lot of data yet that's specifically useful. But it's also good because it makes you aware that you have a microbiome and you need to treat it nicely and you need to not kill it every few months with antibiotics because you have a little sniffle and you need to be eating kimchi and probiotics. It fosters that awareness at least, right? <laughs> It does, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that anyone who I've ever worked with who has brought me their gut test results, whether a full microbiome analysis or just a basic Genova or doctor's diagnostic, you know, three-day stool panel, which isn't a full microbiome analysis, but that is an analysis of some of the things going on in the gut, they uh, almost 100% of the time, the people who have deficiencies in bacteria particularly the people who across the board just have low levels of bacteria as a whole, they experience GI issues, they experience digestive issues, and they all tend to be a population who's not eating enough fiber and fermented foods, right? So, so, you know, that's a situation where I can confidently tell someone when I'm looking at that data, dude, you need to start having a green smoothie for breakfast and a salad for lunch and some kimchi and sauerkraut with dinner and you're probably going to feel better based on what I've seen the other people that I've worked with. Yeah. But again, you know, I'm not big data. I'm not an artificial intelligence computer. It's just me <laughs> operating based on what I've seen. Uh, oh yeah, I'll see like a C-reactive protein that's a little bit high, and I'll tell them to just start eating some fiber every day, and it'll come down. It's it's, it's incredible, like right. the anecdotal correlation there sometimes. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it is. That's pretty amazing. So let's move on to the next topic on our wellness wheel. Um, one of the things I really want to talk to you about is sleep. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is something that, you know, I a lot sleep. of people, yeah, me too. I'm a big fan of sleep <laughs> and I love tracking my sleep and I kind of play a game with myself on my sleep monitor every day to see how I'm doing and wh when I, uh, when I fall off the wagon on my sleep uh, as well. Do you track your sleep and what? It, where, I do. Yeah. I do track my sleep. I didn't used to because I felt that when I tracked my sleep, I became so obsessive over it that it disrupted my sleep. <laughs> And I found that, uh, you know, almost very similar to entrainment, right? Like binaural beats for sleep don't work for the first few times you use them. And then suddenly they start to work or, you know, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy mats or PEMF mats. A lot of people are sleeping on like they don't really work at first and they do work kind of in the opposite. When I first started quantifying sleep for a while, it, it almost did the opposite and messed up my sleep. And then I just got used to it and quit worrying and obsessing over the data. And now I actually, I get better sleep when I'm, quantifying because I think I'm almost like competitive and I really want to make sure that I yeah. get a good night of sleep and I've got my readiness score when I wake up in the morning and I can see my deep sleep cycles and I can the know the things to avoid. I, I'm using the ring. Yeah. yeah, I'm using the aura ring. This one that I'm wearing right now. And uh, generally what I look for is my sleep latency, how, how, how long it took me to fall asleep. Uh, I look at my deep sleep percentages and I look at, at my REM sleep or my light sleep percentages, number of times that I woke body temperature and heart rate during the night and then heart rate variability. These are all parameters of recovery and, and proper sleep rhythm. And I've, I've found that there are certain low hanging fruits that surprised me when it comes to enhancing sleep. There are things that we know now definitely disrupt sleep that I think most people are aware of playing on your phone at night in bed, especially if you aren't wearing blue light blocking glasses or don't have night mode enabled, uh, just having lights on bright lights in your room in general, working out too close to bedtimes so that you really have high body temperature or just sleeping in a room that's too hot or a room that's too noisy, or a room that has the curtains open, and so when 5 a.m. rolls around in the summertime, it's late, and you're waking up an hour earlier than you wanted to. We know a lot of this stuff. The stuff that surprised me, that moved the dial the most, if I could share a few things with you. Number one was that my quality of sleep is directly correlated to the amount of bright sunshine I get before noon. Right. And so today, before I came over here, you know, I'm staying at, at the at the London West Hotel down the street 
and I had about an hour of work to do between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m., so I brought my computer and my breakfast and everything up to the pool deck, and I worked in the pool deck in the sunshine, and I always make it a point to get outside in the sunshine based on the sleep data that I'm getting now every day before noon. Bright sunlight exposure in the early day is just as important as artificial light and blue light mitigation later on in the day. I've found that that one really moves the dial. If you can't get out before noon, you still see some benefit by just like finishing up work at four or five and just like getting out before the sun goes down. I mean, like that, that really helps. The, and the more skin you can get exposed because your skin has all sorts of opsins and photoreceptors and photoreceptor proteins in it, the better. Even your, even your testicles, guys, have <laughs> your, your testicles are an eye. Your skin is an eye and so are your balls. Uh, that, that's why, actually, that's one of the reasons that the testicles respond so well to this, this concept of photobiomodulation totally. or, or red light therapy. You yeah. know, it's a thing guys are doing now for testosterone, kind of a rabbit hole, but, but that actually works. So sunlight is one. Uh, another one that particularly for, uh, for deep sleep seems to make a really big difference would be anything that targets the endocannabinoid system. So anything like, like a CBD vape pen or a CBD uh, edible or tincture or capsule, that I find particularly when combined with a gamma aminobutyric acid precursor like passion flower or valerian or chamomile or even pH GABA, that one-two combo just knocks me out like a baby. Now, a lot of these CBDs, when you get them, a serving size is, in many cases, 10 to 30 milligrams. I find that most people, including myself and a lot of the clients that I work with, respond very well to 60 to 100, right? So that's the problem is I think a lot of people use CBD, but they don't use enough. But when you do like some CBD and some chamomile tea or some CBD and some kind of like herb that's got valerian root or passion flower, or any of these GABA precursors in it, that one really moves the dial as well. Um, that's for getting more deep sleep. That's for increasing. That, that deep would be for increasing yeah. particularly the deep sleep percentages. Interesting. Um, and then the, the final one that, that I think is very important because we talk about some things that are exogenous supplementation yeah. or that involve, you know, you know, you and I were talking about this before the podcast episode, the, the modern medicines infatuation, particularly in functional medicine and the anti-aging industry with peptides and SARMs and supplements and, you know, red light for your balls and PEMF mats and, and all this jazz. Anything they can sell you. Right. Any, any, and, and a lot of that stuff works, but I think it's important also to understand your body's built-in endogenous capability, uh, particularly in the realm of relaxation and de-stressing. And, of course, you know, you as, as a guy who, who has a history of Ayurvedic medicine understand the concept of prana, of the breath being one of the best ways to control the body, to either activate or deactivate the sympathetic nervous system. And I find that anything that involves a breathwork protocol has helped me tremendously with that component that I named as sleep latency, or like how long it takes you to fall asleep. So once you put away the, the phone, and for me it's usually a paper book at night, once I folded up the paper book, right now it's Harry Potter, and, yeah. and put, put that aside, I'm in a race with my kids right now to finish the Harry Potter series. Uh, you, you have a breathwork protocol that you do. You just lay there with your eyes closed, and yeah, maybe you have some, some special white noise playing or binaural beats. I know a lot of people are into these apps that can help yeah. to improve sleep. I use one called Sleep Stream. There's another one called Brain FM that I use. But a lot of times I'll put on those tracks and I'll just lay there, and the two forms of breath work that I find really decrease my sleep latency, how long it takes me to fall asleep, are box breathing or 478 breathing. Box breathing is four count in, four count hold, four count out, four count hold. 478 is four count in, seven count hold, eight count out. Mm. Either of those breathwork protocols do a really good job with sleep latency. So uh, I, there's, there's a ton of things you do for sleep. We could probably talk for hours on sleep, but get early day sunshine, try CBD if you haven't yet, mm -hmm. and then also have a breathwork protocol that you use. And any of these things seem to kind of operate on that principle of entrainment, meaning the more you do it and more frequently you do it, the more it seems to help with sleep. And part of that is probably the same reason that 
an NBA player does better with their free throws when they really dial in their, their pre free throw routine, you know, three bounces, the basketball look to the left, (laughs) wink at your wife, you know, tap your chest twice, shoot, you know, same thing, early morning sunlight, CBD, breathwork protocol, boom, lights out. So the more you can build things into a routine, the better. Absolutely. Yeah. And for people that have insomnia, especially like if you can get into a, a really set routine, you can sometimes break through this insomnia barrier that a lot of people have. Um, I, I have kind of used melatonin off and on with some people, um, just in small dosages, just for a limited amount of time. Have you ever, what are your feelings on yeah, melatonin? I like, or? I like melatonin when I travel, I'm grabbing my right. phone here so we could look at my sleep scores from last night. Uh, I like melatonin when I travel, uh, especially West to East melatonin doesn't work so well East to West. So West to East melatonin is good. And then, um, Generally, if I've traveled extensively, especially to the west or to the east, if I go to Japan, I take a lot of melatonin. I'll take like 40 to 50 milligrams of melatonin as a way to just push the giant reboot button on the circadian rhythm. Uh, And your melatonin production decreases. Your your pineal gland becomes a little less efficient as you age. So you kind of get to the point where at a certain stage in life, just like I feel like sometimes... Uh, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is actually a good thing later in life if you really want to optimize yeah, health and vitality. Absolutely. You could say the same thing for sleep and melatonin. The same thing could be said also for digestive enzymes. Like you just produce less of them as you age, so your your protein absorption decreases. There are certain things that are just smart to do right. as you age, even though our ancestors might not have done those exact things per se. Um, Th- th- that doesn't necessarily mean that, that that this is a modern bastardization of ancestry. It's just no. smart things that we have access to that our ancestors didn't. Yep. Uh, but ultimately, with melatonin, I find that, that for me, about 0.3 up to about 3 milligrams as a pretty regular thing, mm-hmm. and then a lot more than that when I travel west to east to help out with the circadian rhythm sure. works works very, very well. I like some of those time-release. Like I think it's Natron, make some time-release capsules, uh, I'll use like the, uh, like the sublingual stuff sometimes, uh, like the sublingual melatonin spray. Um, so yeah, I'm a fan of melatonin. Yeah. Uh, of, of course, don't take melatonin, but be looking at your phone at night and yeah. not <laughs> using blue light blockers and doing all these things that inhibit melatonin production. Cause that's kind of putting gasoline on the fire on one exactly. end and, and water on the other. So my sleep score from last night, uh, I slept eight hours and 44 minutes. My resting heart rate was 36. It looks like I had six wake ups, but they were very short. My sleep latency was actually 17 minutes. That's actually a little bit longer than it normally takes yeah. me to fall asleep. So, and that's pretty typical when I'm traveling, uh-huh. right? There's more thoughts racing through my head, sure. and it's easier for me to fall asleep when my wife's like snuggled up next right. to me. I just find I fall asleep faster. <laughs> me too. Uh, my deep sleep was 21%, uh, which is good. Like having that in 15 to 20% range is good. REM sleep was 25%, and uh, my resting heart rate was 36 but wow, you know and this, this, is, this is why it's interesting to look at data my average heart rate especially between about uh it looks like 11 p.m and 1 a.m was higher than normal and i can tell you exactly why it's because i had a ribeye steak for dinner last night uh, i had that ribeye steak at about 8 p.m so i was yeah. digesting food and that jacked up the heart rate yeah. ideally you'd finish up a heavy meal three hours prior to bedtime That's so, important, so that right? doesn't happen or ideally i would have gone for a walk outside in the cold yes. or even taken a cold shower or done something to decrease my body temperature a little bit after i didn't i was a lazy ass and i got in bed and read harry potter instead but, uh, you know, that, that's just an example of some of the things you can find out when you're looking at your sleep data. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. I was just looking at my sleep score. I had a 90 sleep score. Oh. and But your heart rate, I mean, that 38 is incredible. Yeah, but I'm an endurance athlete. Yeah, that, that's a big yeah. part of it. I don't, I don't have bradycardia. I'm just, so, yeah, my, my score is 94. What's your, what's your readiness? You know, I don't use the, the ring, so I don't okay. get a readiness score. I use okay. Bedit. Yeah, okay. And the Nokia Bedit. monitor. Yeah. My readiness is 87, which is good. Because I just got back from the Dominican Republic last week. And if you look at my first few scores after I got back from the Dominican Republic, like first three days I got back, I'm 69, 64, 57. That's what like heavy travel does to your body. You know, and I'm just now, it looks like the past six days, I'm finally like back up and like my app gives me a little crown, like a little reward. I love it. I'm back up above 80. (laughs) So it's like. I know it sounds getting to use this word again, gimmicky, but I, it's fun I'm kind of yeah, I'm kind of motivated by that. Yeah, stuff. it's so motivational. I'm motivated by the step count too. Like, yeah. Oh, I love I the get, step count. Like, right. like when I'm wearing my my ring uh, or anything else that quantifies, yeah. I get fifteen thousand steps a day, and yeah. I will like 
if I'm at 13,000, I finish up dinner and I'm tired and want to go to bed, oh, I will yeah. often just like go outside and walk up and down the driveway and get my, which sounds just like total type A <laughs> anal retentive orthorexic, but I think the pros outweigh the cons. Yeah. Of, of really having like a set goal and just nailing it every day. It's so true. I mean, like having a number to, to look at on a day-to-day basis is, and having someone else you're doing this with too helps. My wife yeah. and I wake up every morning, we compare sleep scores and I'm like bummed when she's, she's, she, oh, she gets a hundred a lot of times. I'm yeah. like, how do she's like a rock star with that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who's got more yin, all the ladies, they've got more yin in many cases. They, they sleep better. My wife doesn't take supplements. She doesn't quantify anything. She doesn't. <laughs> use any sleep strategy she she's complete opposite of me you know her job is she's outside planting flowers and gardening and and playing in the fruit orchard and pushing alfalfa down to the goats and getting eggs from the chickens and so she's just got a different life altogether she probably needs less of the biohacks because she's just living more more naturally and i know people are like well why ben ben why don't you start farming and sit at home and write your books and farm and quit getting on airplanes. And, and the, the reason for that is I've been placed in a position to where God has given me a platform where I'm actually able to get out there and help people out. Absolutely. And part of that platform does involve me having to be at the mercy of airplanes right. and computers and Wi-Fi routers and hotels with moldy carpets, you know, just, just everything. And so I'm fighting an uphill battle, but I'm Absolutely. okay with that because I do feel like I'm helping a lot of people out more than and actually like before I launched my company two and a half years ago, I was this close. I know this is an audio podcast partially, but I'm, I'm making really a very small <laughs> approximate. I was this close to just like being, I remember I was talking to, it was, uh, uh, my friend Mark Manson who wrote the, the book. Uh, what is it like? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the book with how not to give a fuck. I think is the name of the book. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and he was like, yeah, I just sit at home and write, and I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I could do that. But then, like, I, I did a lot of deep soul searching, and I thought, geez, I just, like, I feel like I would be shorting myself. And, you know, for, for some reason, I've uh, you know, God gave me not that many skills, but there's a few that I can do well. Like, I, I can, I can uh, research and disseminate information and speak it to people well so I can speak from stage and I'm, I'm not scared to be speaking from stage and I can I can write and dialogue with people both online and offline pretty well in the realm of health and fitness and I can write but like writing is like kind of like one third yeah. of what I can do and so yeah because I've chosen to embrace this post-industrial lifestyle and hop on airplanes and be on computers and get on stages and go to conferences and have to sleep in the hotel room for the conference. Like, yeah, I have to do a a lot of shit to keep my body feeling pretty good. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And you know, like you said, you have a great, great platform. I mean, you're spreading your wealth of knowledge that you've accumulated and it involves some travel and you have to kind of mitigate the effects of some. (laughs) Like like, we're so thankful you came to LA. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, Another big part of the circadian rhythm and just rhythms and biology and nature is controlling when you eat your food and then tying in some fasting with that as well. Like you said, it's incredible how religions have been having us fast for centuries and no one even really knew that that increased your mitochondrial density or your longevity or telomere length. Yeah. Like I come from the Hindu religion and my parents, they fast one day a week and then one week every three or four months. And then like for like two weeks a year. And it's like just part of their religion. It's part of the protocol that, Right. Somehow was figured it's, out for and them. It's not even something they incredible. do for a year because they're on a special diet. It's like right. their whole life. Right. That's what they do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, what's your fasting routine now? Well, I, I do agree with you that fasting is one of the lowest hanging fruits for cellular autophagy, for inhibition of that mTOR pathway, for uh, healing the gut. And it's it's so seldomly utilized, or at least utilized relatively less than a lot of the medications and supplements and biohacks that people are doing. Because if you look at it, it is a stoic root. It's not a hedonistic root. It's not a superfood smoothie you can drink. It's not a medication you can inject and feel right away. It's kind of hard, right? And and it's I like think faith. that's why a lot of people <laughs> don't do it, right? Just like the spiritual disciplines. The, you know, fasting is a spiritual discipline. So is meditation. A lot of people know it's good for you, but not a lot of people do it. Right. So is silence and solitude, sure. prayer, study, devotions, uh, a lot of you know, gr- a gratitude practice. Yeah. These are all things that move the dial significantly for your health. 
and and for just your ability to be able to make the world a better place. Right. But they're stoic, right? And people are not big fans of this stoic route. But even when you look at things like, you know, take rapamycin, one of the darlings of the anti-aging yep. industry right now, you know, this chemical that's produced by soil discovered on, on Easter Island. I, I think it's called Rapa Nui is the name of the island, so they call it rapamycin. And it uh, it does affect a lot of longevity pathways favorably. It also suppresses the immune system and, and creates, in some cases, increased risk for yeah, diabetes and, right and cancers. Dose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. the do- yeah, the dose is the poison. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the way that it interacts with the immune system is by partially suppressing that mTOR pathway. Uh, but, you know, when, when you look at this from, from a stoic standpoint, well, maybe before you start spending money on rapamycin, you should engage in something else that activates that those same pathways or inhibits those same pathways, you know, activating cellular autophagy, inhibiting mTOR, and that's just fasting, yeah. right? There's a lot of people paying a lot of money for rapamycin when they could, they could fast. Uh, yeah, and and uh, when, it, when it comes to fasting, what works for one person may not work for another, but what I do, I, I'm an example of someone who is very active. I'm still competing professionally in Spartan racing, and so my exercise throughput is very high. For me, the fasting scenario that works very well is a daily 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast, meaning I might stop eating at, at 8 p.m. and then I won't eat again till 10 a.m. the next day. I compress all of my food into about a 12 hour window during the day. And that's because I'm active. I recommend to less active people an eight to a 10 hour window sure. of feeding. Uh, I eat more carbohydrates in the evening, particularly to top off my energy stores for the next day's workout and to get that serotonin sleep enhancing effect of the carbohydrate, right? Like I, I didn't have carbohydrates all day yesterday. And then with that steak, I had some sweet potato, uh, I had some broccoli mash, which is, which that's not high in starches. And then I had half a bar of, of the, uh, the who dark chocolate and an organic glass of red wine, right? Yes. So I probably had about 100 grams of carbohydrates last night. Did you bring your own wine with that, you when you travel? No, no, but I, <laughs> but I ask. So what I do is I ask at restaurants for organic and biodynamic, and if I can't find it, I'll at least get usually like a Bordeaux or a Burgundy or like, like a French or Italian. A lot of times you, you have a pretty good chance of sure. it being created using more old-world biodynamic methods. But at home, I'll drink the Dry Farm or the, or the Fit Fine wine. Um the other thing that I do in addition to the 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast is, and I just started doing this recently in this past year, uh, three to four times a year, I do a five day fasting mimicking diet where I'm mm-hmm. eating fewer calories than I normally would typically during an easier recovery week. Uh, Prolon is, is the packaged version of that made popular by Dr. Walter Longo and his company El Nutra. Right. But what I like to use is probably more up your alley. It's more of like an Ayurvedic approach. Sure. I do uh, kitchari, which mm-hmm. is like, like an Indian cleansing stew with split yes. mung beans and a lot of really good herbs like coriander and cumin yeah. and, and um, what's it called? Hing, I believe it's called. Yeah, the hing herb, which is, which is fantastic. And then I just do a little bit of coconut yogurt. I do a lot of celery juice. Uh, I pair that with a uh, high mineral intake. Uh, I'll, I'll even drink Epsom salts during that to help to oh. move things through and get the gallbladder nice. flow going. And then I do uh, a few coffee enemas during that protocol as well. So my purpose when I do uh, a fasting mimicking diet is to really focus on the liver mm. and the gallbladder. And part of that is is due to the high number of calories I eat just as a, as a hardcore athlete. Right, So I know my liver and gallbladder work. Right harder than usual and i feel very good when i use kind of like that that modified kind of like ayurvedic cleansing yeah, version exactly. of a fasting mimicking diet and then finally at least two times per month i try to fast saturday dinner to sunday dinner mm. which is pretty easy to do you just yeah. have dinner on saturday and right. maybe you know depending on how active sunday is or if i have a big day of snowboarding or hiking with my kids i'll have like a cup of bone broth or some ketone esters or something to kind of keep the metabolism or the energy levels elevated a little bit. Nice. Uh, but that's my protocol, 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast daily, uh, the twice a month, 24 hour fast. And then a few times a year, that five day fasting mimicking diet. That's more of a cleanse. Yeah. I like it. How you've worked in so like an Ayurvedic type of diet into your fasting mimicking diets. So right. Has, and I like, I love Walter Longo's diet as well. I've used that before. Yeah. It's, it's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah, the Prolon kits. The Prolon kits, yeah. right. I just feel like, yeah, those are done for you. And anytime you can lower the barrier to entry, exactly. great. But I just have access to so many whole foods at yeah. home, and I can get some nice organic celery and make myself celery juice and make that stew. I love the taste of it. I, 
I make my own coconut yogurt using an, an L. Ruteri strain of probiotic, and I, yeah. I ferment that for about 24 hours with, with some really good coconut milk. and. Nice. And I put some uh, some some uh, uh, gelatin in there, you know, to thicken it. A little bit of stevia, and I I put a, a dollop of that on top of the kitchen, and just works. It works for <laughs> me. And I, and it's something like I could do that breakfast, lunch, and dinner for five days, and still be sitting there, you know, eating it with a smile on my face. Yeah. And it's, it's relatively filling because of the lentils, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Anything else you like detox with uh, besides the diet? Well, the Epsom salts, the coffee enema, uh, four to five times a week when I'm at home, I do the infrared sauna for about 20 to 30 minutes. So uh, when I'm in there, I do dry skin brushing, which also helps out a little bit. Uh, I don't take a lot of cleansing supplements per se. For me, it's it's more whole foods and then uh, the coffee enema. Uh, When I'm traveling, I use a suppository called uh, Glidamin. And I'll use that one or two times a week while I'm traveling. When I'm what at home, vitamin? I just do. It's kind of like a suppository version of a coffee enema. Oh, okay. You know, it's it's caffeine. I believe there's some glutamine in there. there there's a few other compounds that will increase bile flow. Nice. And you know, they're expensive. They're like eighty dollars for a packet of ten or twelve or something like that. But you know, it's just you know, which is expensive compared to a you know nickel coffee sure. enema. Yeah. Uh, but that's what I do when I travel. Um, and those are really the main things. I've read sauna and, and yeah. the coffee enema and then just food. Yeah. So sauna is great if you have access to a sauna. I mean, if you can get one in your house, that's amazing. But yeah. there's a lot of sauna yeah. places coming popping up nowadays. And uh, you're on NAD right now. I know. I was just fantastic. glancing. I was yeah. just glancing up at my NAD IV to see how I'm doing. Yeah. Are you still I running there? Yeah. It looks like you're still dripping. Yeah, it's in. still going. It's still great. dripping. Awesome. Yep. Very good. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of NAD, <laughs> second NAD over here at Excel that you've had. Um, yeah. Tell me, tell me, like, well, let's take it a step back before we talk about NAD. What are your? We talked about a few things about increasing your mitochondrial density, increasing, you know, um, longevity. Um, getting on the topic of longevity, you talked about rapamycin. I assume you haven't talked taken any rapamycin um, yet. No, <laughs> I haven't taken it. I, I do eat some things that would be considered to. So, have you heard of spermidine before? Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. So, spermidine is found in. A lot of fermented cheeses, some whole grains, some fermented soy products, some dark leafy greens, a few different seeds and nuts. And it actually, it's, it's like almost like a food version of rapamycin. So I'll, I'll do things like that sometimes. I do not drink my own sperm. No, nor do I, drink, I don't drink anyone's sperm for that matter. Uh, nor do I have a whale that I milk. But, uh, well, you know, I do have a whale that I milk, just not not what you're thinking. Uh, that. That joke fell flat. Um, anyways, though, the uh, the thing is that I, I do not use rapamycin. Like I mentioned, I'm, I feel like I get enough autophagy and mTOR through right. fasting. So yeah, right, absolutely. Yeah. Are you taking your metformin? No, okay. I do not take metformin. I Burberry. I like some of the data mm-hmm. on metformin, uh, particularly with its ability to be able to reduce a little bit of the activity of the electron transport chain. Uh, so it kind of downregulates some mitochondrial activity, uh, which is good for longevity. Not so good if you're an athlete, honestly. Right. I don't like. I don't. I don't think athletes benefit from metformin. No. So there's kind of a paradox there. Um, the the other issues with with metformin would be some of the data that I've seen on increased risk for diabetes, and I believe it may have been. I don't have the studies in front of me. Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. And patients who are taken for a long time, like 12 plus years regularly, uh, there's, there's some Japanese studies that just kind of, kind of make me question whether or not I should be using that versus some of the natural ways to increase insulin sensitivity or to control glycemic variability, particularly one that you've just named berberine, bitter melon extract, Ceylon cinnamon, apple cider vinegar, curcumin, ginseng, there's a lot of compounds that I just kind of work into my smoothies or my diet naturally. Probably the one I use the most is bitter melon extract. Uh, I take two capsules of that every night before dinner, before I eat those carbohydrates. Oh. So I get better partitioning into muscle and liver tissue. Sure. And so that my blood sugar lowers pretty quickly. You know, I'm kind of back into ketosis pretty quickly sure. by the time I go to bed after that evening carbohydrate refeed. Oh. So I use, I use things that are like metformin but not metformin. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I know that Japanese study that you're talking about. Um, you know, there's a lot of studies showing kind of the opposite, that metformin prevents Alzheimer's yeah, there as well, are. prevents dementia. So, 
you know, it's, all of this needs to be worked out. I know NIH has funded like a hundred million dollars to really study metformin in depth. Yeah, the so, other one they need to look at is B twelve. There's some there's some yeah. studies on B twelve deficiencies, right, which of absolutely. course you just take B twelve. But yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just like I don't. Same thing with rapamycin. Like metformin and rapamycin, I know there's a lot of kind of people in the anti aging and longevity industry obsessing over those right now. But I just like I'm right now. I'm still for those two going more of like the herbs, spices, and fasting route sure, versus I taking the medications. Yeah, why not? You have the natural stuff available to you. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about brain health. We touched on Alzheimer's a little bit. Um, what are some of your strategies to optimize? I mean, you're like one of the quickest thinking, wittiest guys I've ever met. Oh, geez, and thanks. Your, your neurons are constantly firing. You I did like tell. my joke about milking my <laughs> whale did. for sperm I, then. Okay. I was actually the one okay. person in the room that yeah. got it. All, yeah, all you okay. need is one person, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> So there's only three of us in the room anyway right now. I'm sure some anyway, sixth right grade now, is listening so. and snickering. <laughs> Absolutely, right? But what what have you kind of, um, you know, barring uh, nootropics right now, let's talk about other strategies besides nootropics. What are you using to kind of optimize your brain throughput? No, no, modafinil and cerebral lysine injections. That's it, bro. That's that's all one needs. <laughs> no. Um, so so for, for cognitive throughput, uh, really – one of the best things that you can do, and this sounds simple and silly, but it kind of sticks to the theme of you know kind of choosing the low hanging natural fruit first, uh, would be uh, music. And I, I'm a firm believer not only in the data behind music and its ability to enhance neurogenesis, but also the joy that it brings emotionally in terms of the frequency of the music almost having like a sound healing effect, which is an entire branch of energy medicine in of itself right now, the use of gongs and dulcimers and didgeridoos and all manner of, you know, there are even sound healing tables that incorporate sound healing. But for me, I'd rather heal myself with the instrument that I'm playing and be able to just be bathed in those frequencies while I'm also spinning some dials in my brain and making some smoke come out my ears trying to learn the ukulele yeah. or the guitar i'm doing a lot of singing songwriting right now i finally Amazing. hired a hired a coach to help me produce my first album uh when i travel usually i'll do the harmonica sometimes i'll bring my baritone ukulele on the plane uh so uh, so i'm a huge fan of music as one Very option cool. and you can find at meetup.com or you know, or Facebook or any number of places like groups you can join. You can find instructors on Craigslist, et cetera. And there are really good websites uh, that that train you in music, like Ultimate Guitar or Guitar Tricks. You know, those are a couple that I use. So that's one thing. I would be learning something new. It doesn't have to be music, right? It can be a sport. It can be slacklining. It can be anything that kind of targets the nervous system and triggers the nervous system. I'm not a fan of the games like Lumosity and Brainscape and... Right. They make you better at playing the game, but they nice. don't necessarily have crossover into the real world, nor do they bring you much joy like music does or have uh, give you the ability to be able to entertain or, or kind of have other people enjoy what you're learning. And then it's just one more reason to be on your device, okay. right? So I'm not a huge fan of a lot of these things you do on the device or the computer to increase right. cognition. So uh, music is one. Uh, I do a lot of reading, but I try to read outside of my sector of health and fitness and nutrition, particularly fiction. I both read and write fiction, which I find to be very good for tapping into some of the more right-brained uh, side of things. And uh, so I write fiction almost every day. I read fiction almost every day, uh, play music or listen to music almost every day. Uh, and, and then the, the last thing I would say, and this is an interesting one for neurogenesis. Like we know that fasting and sauna use and a lot of these things can increase brain derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF, which is kind of like miracle growth for the brain. But I still do. I, I did this for a while and just started doing it again because I got my hands on a really good strain of psilocybin. And I've seen a lot of really good data behind neurogenesis and the use of psilocybin or mushroom extracts. And so about every three days, I do two packets of the Four Sigmatic Lion's Mane extract sure. and about 0.2 grams of psilocybin. Mm -hmm. 
And I find that not only do I have better cognitive performance during the day, but like the next several day va- days afterwards, I have a clear head. I can learn things more readily. Uh, it works, works very well. So that would be one thing from a, from a nutrition standpoint that I like. From like a biohacking standpoint, the other thing, two things I've been using that seem to really help out with having a clear head, um, even allowing you to achieve a deep meditative state or to be able to engage in skill acquisition or complex motor tasks more readily would be the Halo TDCS device, which is worn on the head for about 20 minutes prior to any skill acquisition activity like music or prior to a hard workout. And you could like wear it on a bicycle for 20 minutes and then get off and do your weight training set, for example. And that's using targeted TDCS to enhance motor neuron activity. Uh, it looks just like a pair of Dr. Dre beats that you wear and, and uh, just 20 minutes on. It's called a transcranial direct stimulation. The other one is called a, a violite, and I talked about photobiomodulation as being like a, a wavelength of light you could use on, on the testicles to increase testosterone production or on the skin to increase, increase collagen production. But it can also activate the uh, cytochrome C oxidase activity in the mitochondria of neural tissue, and there is a, a head-worn light called the violite that actually uses targeted forms of light therapy at either a 10 hertz range for alpha production or 40 hertz for theta production. They've got some good research on Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, I feel like it just gives me a super clear head. Like anything, like any form of light or radiation, you can overdo it and create excess radical oxygen species um, or reactive oxygen species if you if you overdo it. So this is something I do about once every two days max. Uh, but that that one that I use is made by a company called Violite. The TDCS is made by a company called Halo. Mm-hmm. And then you know, trying to learn new activities. Specifically for me, music is a biggie and mm-hmm. fiction is a biggie. And then occasionally doing like a dose of psilocybin with lion's mane. Uh, that, that's it. And occasionally that's I'll right. chomp some nicotine gum. I love it. I love it. Yeah. You. We were talking about you. What do you use to test your kind of cognitive uh, speed do you, do you have a testing device uh, on your desk I mean, there, there's like the you cns were, tap test yeah. app for the phone i have it on my phone i don't, mm-hmm. I don't use it that much mm-hmm. uh there's the other one the uh brain it looks like a computer mouse uh ironically i don't remember the name of my brain training <laughs> device it's, it. it's i don't even use yeah. it that much but it 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 uh, it's like a, got a button on the left and a button on the right, and something will pop up on the screen. You got to press the button, or you'll feel the buttons vibrate, and you have to press the one that vibrates. Yeah. So it's like reaction time. Yeah. Uh, I forget the name of it, but that's another one. Uh, but I uh, my my brain performance or my central nervous system speed is not something I regularly quantify. Yeah. It's just not. For a while, I was doing it, and now I just like. If I can learn or sing a song better on the guitar, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm learning. It's, yeah. it's, something's working. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, my rule is if I'm engaged in activity every day that leaves me just a little bit confused, even mildly irritable, smoke coming out the ears, uh, outside my comfort zone, I know I'm triggering neurogenesis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. I do all these uh, brain health talks about keeping your brain health optimized and like on corporate lectures and everyone can't wait to get to the nootropic section of the course. And I'm like, you guys, gratitude, yeah. hanging out with friends, learning something new. That's right. 99% of the formula, the nootropics. Yeah. You have to get all that other stuff right first. Yeah. Meditate, you know, the two have some quiet stack time. well, but yeah, you need yeah. the lower hanging fruit first. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, there are things that can enhance, uh, white adipose to brown adipose fat conversion in the presence of cold, mm-hmm. you know, like like it was something I already named. Bitter melon extract can assist with that. Green tea polyphenols can help out with that. Curcumin, but don't necessarily you know start all the supplement stacks and get all those lined up and take like first just make sure you can get in the cold shower and take a cold shower and then gradually introduce kind of the the icing on the cake. Exactly, exactly. So um, one of the topics that we haven't hit on yet is. And you, you kind of hit on it a little bit. Your, your heart rate is 38 when you're sleeping. I mean, what are your strategies for optimizing your cardiovascular performance? This is something that, you know, as you age, it gets to be more kind of top of mind, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I see a lot of clients in their 50s that are just, you know, worried about um, not being able to be on the treadmill for more than 10 or 15 mm-hmm. minutes without feeling kind of short of breath and unable to keep up. Um, do you have any strategies around cardiovascular performance? 
Yes, I would. I would give you kind of three different areas we could chunk this into: nervous system, exercise, and diet. For the nervous system, I'm a big fan of the information put out by the Heart Math Institute and heart rate variability training. Tracking your heart rate variability and actually using something like neurofeedback. Uh, there are apps like Nature Beat and Sweet Beat that will allow you to wear a heart rate monitor and then train you via specific breath work and relaxation protocols to have a lower, I'm sorry, a higher heart rate variability, which is the delta, the amount of time spent in between heartbeats. And it's directly reflective of your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system balance. And the more that people are able to control consciously their nervous system through that type of neurofeedback, the better they're able to do things like get a lower resting heart rate or control the propensity for the heart rate to, to rise rapidly and for you to have an exaggerated sympathetic nervous response to stress or to exercise. So that would be one would be heart rate variability training from a dietary standpoint. I think that it returns to a little bit of self quantification, right? Testing. Are you APOE three, four, 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 which would dictate higher risk of cardiovascular disease in response to say, a high saturated fat ketogenic diet, which a lot of people are doing these days. And you might need to eat more of like a ketavan fiber and starch rich diet, or you might need more of a Mediterranean diet rich in mono and polyunsaturated fats versus a lot of the, the saturated like butter fat, coconut oil type of approach. Uh, I would also say that, um, you know, there, there are other things you should, you should pay attention to from, a cardiovascular standpoint on your blood markers. Like we talked about inflammation, track homocysteine, track fibrinogen, track HSCRP, make sure that you don't have rampant inflammation, which, which especially if you're eating a, a whole foods rich diet, you're probably going to have slightly higher cholesterol anyways. I mean, if you have egg yolks and fatty fish and some organic red meat and olive oil, all of these things can increase cholesterol. You just don't want that cholesterol to become atherosclerotic. And one of the ways that that can happen is if you do have a lot of inflammation. So incorporate, incorporate herbs and spices and things that can help to lower inflammation, uh, and also pay attention to your genes and make sure you're eating a diet that agrees with you from a cardiovascular risk standpoint. Uh, the, the last piece exercise, of course, include those things I named earlier, uh, twice a week, do a Tabata set one to two times a week, do that 30 seconds on four minutes off. Once a week, train the VO2 max, engage in low level physical activity all day long, particularly with some intermittent fasts overnight. Uh, I even encourage people to do that. Some of their low level physical activity in a fasted state in the morning, perfect time to go out and get that sunshine I was talking about. But I also think that it's beneficial just from a pure, a pure fat loss standpoint, but also a cardiovascular aerobic fitness and metabolic efficiency standpoint to have one time during the week. And I always do this when I'm traveling. It's a walk through the city. When I'm at home, it's a hike or snowboarding or, or tennis or anything like that where you're engaged in some type of movement for a longer period of time in a fasted state. So this would be how you would train like metabolic or fat burning efficiency. So that would be like a nice hike outdoors in the sunshine on a Saturday when you wake up and you know, you're instead of doing a big Saturday brunch, you're going on a big Saturday hike fasted after you've had maybe a cup of coffee. So in addition to incorporating the high intensity interval training, I think that every once in a while you just need to go out and do something slightly longer to build up that aerobic efficiency. Um, the last thing is just pay attention to, to red blood cell health, you know, and, and we do know that sauna can increase erythropoietin, which can be a really good, you know, same thing that Tour de France riders will dope with. That's something that you could increase by, uh, sitting in the sauna or after a workout or a movement session going and sitting in the sauna when your body temperature is high. There are things that can increase your red blood cell production. Uh, echinacea, for example, there are things that can increase your overall blood health. A lot of these red things, you know, we call this the doctrine of, what is it, the, the doctrine of nature, I believe, you know, how carrots are good for your eyes and when you slice a carrot and into little slices and you look at that slice, it looks like an eye. Eggs are good for your eye. You know, the lutein and the zeaxanthin. We know that walnuts are good for the brain and they look like a little brain. We know that when you cut open a tomato, it kind of looks like the, the internal chambers of the heart. And we know that tomatoes and, and pomegranates similarly are good for the heart. And we know that a lot of these dark red or purple things like 
uh, blueberries and, and grape skin and uh, 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 beets, pomegranate. A lot of these foods are, are good for the blood. So those are a few of the things that I think can be helpful. There are, there are fancier devices. There are like, you know, pulmonary compression devices and compression yeah. boots and all sorts of things that can assist with blood flow and circulation. But I would say those are some of the lower hanging fruits. I love it. I love it. That's a great, great summary of everything you could do. That and, you know, just make sure if you're in your 40s or your 50s, you get tested. You go, you go and get a full cardiac exam. Um, I'm a big believer in fractionated um, cholesterol measurements, so looking for those tiny particles and if you have a high number yeah. of small particles. Yeah, L- looking at particle size and particle count is indeed important. Uh, the, the fractionated test, sometimes it can be confusing to people if they don't have a physician to look over that data with them. What I tell people at least is look for, look for trends. Right. right. Look at your HDL to triglyceride ratio mm-hmm. to be trending downwards. Higher HDL, lower triglycerides. Mm-hmm. Look for your, your total cholesterol to HDL to be usually trending downwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, look at low inflammation at the same time that you have higher cholesterol. Uh, and you know th- th- those are just a few of the biggies. And of course, as with vitamin D, you know, more is not better. The same with yep. HDL. Very Absolutely. interesting data that's come out in the past couple of years showing that high HDL can actually be associated with increased risk of mortality. And so this would dictate that if you test your HDL and it's through the roof, go look at your inflammation because in many cases, high HDL is indicative of the HDL being used to mobilize cholesterols from areas of inflammation. And so you actually need to to pay attention to, to other risk factors if the HDL is high. But to a certain extent, painting with a broad brush, high HDL, low triglycerides, and then paying attention to particle count, you know, low LP, little a, and some of those variables yeah, is, is a absolutely. good idea. Calcium score, do you do you utilize that in any way? I've never done a calcium score. I want to. I yeah. interviewed Dr. William Davis about it on yeah. my podcast, and I love his book, Undoctored. Mm-hmm. He's actually the guy who gave me that coconut yogurt recipe, oh, too. Okay. Yeah, that's his coconut yogurt recipe. Love it that he uses with his clients, but I have yet to do a calcium scan score myself. I want to though. I've done, uh, primarily for my racing and for some reality TV shows I've been on, they do cardiac screens. So I've done the, uh, excuse me, the, um, the, the resting and the exercise EKG, like the VO two max on the treadmill. And as you see with many athletes who have kind of beat themselves up for years with exercise, I do have some PVCs some paraventricular contractions at a very high heart rate. Uh, I also have a little bit of an athlete's heart. I have some of what is called cardiomegaly as shown by an ultrasound echocardiogram that I had done. Again, that's not something that is uncommon in an athlete, but those are two things that have shown me that more exercise is not better. Absolutely. Right. Technically I've, I've probably, uh, uh, increased the aging of my heart. Right. by engaging in, in Ironman triathlon and bodybuilding and Spartan racing and a lot of these more masochistic events. And I, I am curious to see what my calcium scan score is. Just haven't done it yet. Yeah, that's one of the things that we actually do here at Next Health. We do a full body MRI, a oh, calcium wow. score. Um, we, we look at every single blood vessel in your body with the MRI, um, looking for aneurysms and blockages. Uh, we tie that together with calcium score. We, you know, in the full body MRI, of course, we get a brain scan um, looking for masses, tumors, but we also measure the size of your hippocampus. So that's really well correlated with um, Alzheimer's as well. Yeah. So wow. we do a volumetric measurements there. And we we have this whole package that we do, including um, a full genetic, uh, full genome sequencing, not just you know SNPs, full genome sequencing, so we can continue to learn more. And we do this package in conjunction with Human Longevity Institute down in San Diego. It's a Peter Diamandis company. Yes. And we, we do that in um, Los Angeles for, because they're in San Diego. And most people can't get to San Diego in L.A., even though it's only like an hour, a couple hours away. But um, we do that here in uh, Next Health. And the amount of data you can get from that is just incredible. And uh, the calcium score being one point of data, that's, you know, it's it's super valuable information. And it's something that you can actually trend over time. So I had a calcium score that was, you know, moderate heart risk, and I got it down to zero now, which is in, in five years, which for me, um, just, you know, gave me a sense of peace about about potential, you know, coronary events. So just something just something to check that along with the MRI, 
where you're doing the full body MRI and looking for small tumors before you have any symptoms. It's also wow. extremely useful. So yeah, next time you got, maybe we'll tie that into your whole I'm, routine. I'm, here. I would love to do those, those yeah. protocols. That sounds fan, fantastic. Yeah. 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 Those, those are two I haven't done the full body MRI and the calcium scan. So yeah, I've, I've quantified a lot of shit, but have not yet <laughs> done either of those. Have you gotten full yeah. genome sequencing? No, no. The, yeah. I, I've done a relatively comprehensive genome sequencing with, uh, Utrients up in, uh, I believe they're out of Toronto, Canada, but I've never done the full genome. Got so, it. Yeah. Right, yeah. That's one of the, um, one of our, I call it the physical exam for, you know, 2020. This is where we should be with the physical exam. Yeah. No, not just, you know, whipping out a stethoscope, which like most it. doctors don't even do anymore, and feeling on your abdomen a little bit. This is how the physical exam is going to be done in 2020 yeah. on, on everyone, I hope, but we're doing yeah. it here in Next Health now. And, um, you know, about 10% of the time we find something clinically significant in the data. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. The, the so technology is there. If, if people are listening, cause I'll, I'll be sending this sure. podcast to, to some of my audience as well. Uh, they can do that at the Century City location here. Yes. And then where else could they do that? Is there any other Next Health facility? Yeah. So any of our locations in Los Angeles. Um, so we have one in West Hollywood, Century City. We'll be having one um, in the Santa Monica area here pretty soon. Okay. And then you can also do this because we're doing this in partnership with Human Longevity Institute in San Diego. So if you're close to San Diego, cool. you can do it there as well. And, um, you know, as we roll out into more cities, if you see a Next Health in, in your city, come by and we'll. We'll do this whole package for you. What's great about it is, you know, the MRI has been around for a long time now, and the technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So we can, and just like genome sequencing is getting exponentially cheaper, we can sequence a whole human genome now for less than a thousand dollars. Wow! And then it's just like tying all the data in, right? And a calcium score, you can get a calcium score pretty much anywhere. Just talk to your doctor, call any radiology center. A lot of places are doing it for like fifty bucks now. Believe it or not. This was, Amazing. Yeah, this was like $5,000 when it first came out, and now it's $50. So just this exponential trend in how cheap the technology is getting, it's, it's incredible. And what I'm hoping to see is in the next five or 10 years that everyone can do a full body MRI for like $10, $15, you wow. know? But right now it's a little bit more than that. The, the whole package is, you know, somewhere around five to 8000 depending on what options you choose. But I'd love to run you through that one of these I, days. I like and, it. And, you know, I don't. I don't want to make this sound like a like a giant commercial. But I like that. You know, folks can do that. What else? Cryotherapy, right? Photobiomodulation. Uh, the last time I was here, I did the full body composition scan. Yep. Uh, that you know, we've got the IVs like I'm doing right now. I know you guys do like the peptides and some of the other yep. anti aging protocols as well. Exactly. Are there any other machines you have here that I'm forgetting about? Yeah, we have the infrared bed. That's right. Yep. Yeah, which we talked about. That's the same as the photobiomodulation that you exactly. Were talking about. Right. Oh, we have a heat sauna as well. Uh huh. Right. Oh, you do like yes. an infrared sauna. Yes, we do have an infrared sauna as Very well. Cool. We have a capsule, so it's a it's a little bit uh, cleaner, I think, than you know mm-hmm. the one at home where you're sweating all over the place. So we use yeah. a little capsule. Um, and then our next location is actually going to have a hyperbaric chamber as well. Oh, I love which it. Which I love hyperbaric. Yeah, HBOT. Yeah. It's very good. I did some of that yeah. the last time I had a TBI and concussion. I, yeah. I did HBOT, and then I actually injected myself with mannitol to yes. increase my blood-brain barrier yep. permeability and followed that up, chased it with stem cells good. Uh, to get the stem cells into the brain. Although you no longer need to do that. You can now get an intranasal stem cell delivery, like yep. via a spray. So, right, right. We do stem yeah. cells here as well. Um, so like if someone hits their head, we do all those things. And then we also um, recommend being on a keto diet for a while. That yeah. seems to be also helpful. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, anybody who's had a concussion, good hydration, high mineral intake, very high DHA intake, ketogenic diet, uh, right. HBOT, and then right. something like that photobiomodulation for the head particularly. Yes. Man, uh, uh, those are all just... No brainers, pun intended. <laughs> if you if you intended, if you are concussed, I, it, it baffles me when people hit their heads and they're like, "I'm just gonna lay in bed for a day and it's the worst thing sleep this do. off." Yeah, <laughs> it's like immediate treatment. We yeah. see a lot of football players here, and we just like get them yeah. in through the protocol right away. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's all great stuff. Um, and you know, I really believe that uh, medicine really needs to hit the 20th century. You know, it's not even there yet, and yeah. it's amazing all the things that you're doing. Um, you have such a tremendous wealth of knowledge in your head. I'm so glad that you, you know, do podcasts and you're out there. You have your own podcast. How do people find you if they haven't heard of you before? 
just uh, well, I, I have a podcast. I write a lot too. Right. I write an article every week. I'm working on a really big book right now uh, on longevity and anti aging and, and health in general. And that's all over at bengreenfieldfitness.com. The company that I run is called Keon, right. K I O N. And that's where I develop supplement formulations where you can get my books. And I have a gratitude journal. I do a lot of training for personal trainers, nutritionists, physicians, Mm -hmm. folks who want to kind of learn some of this more fringe stuff or stuff that flies under the radar. And so I've got about a a 22-week curriculum called Key on You that I bring Mm -hmm. people through there. So so yeah, my company, Key on at getkeyon.com. It's get K-I-O-N.com and then bengreenfieldfitness.com. I love it. When can we see your new book? It's going to come out near summer of 2020. Perfect. Uh, I, I have never before dropped this URL on a podcast because I was literally just last night finishing up kind of like the landing page for the book website. But the name of the book is actually key K I. Wow. And you can find it, uh, at discover com. Wow. Well, thank you for making our podcast a next episode. I know. I've, no, I've even said that on my <laughs> podcast before. So, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I can't wait to read the book. Well, this has been just tremendous. I'm so excited that you came. And That's what just... happens when you put a needle into somebody's <laughs> arm and the microphone in their face. <laughs> I know. It's like, we're going to get him to stay here for at least an hour and a half for this podcast. That's how we put you. We hooked yeah. you in with the needle. Yeah, exactly. You can't go anywhere. You make me say, I can't even go pee. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you, you're amazing. And uh, I have tremendous respect for you. And I'm just so honored that you came and joined us at the Next Health Podcast. You're here in our location. And I look forward to the next time you're here. Thank you. I love it here. Awesome. (laughs) We'll make make you a member. All right. (laughs) Honorary member. Awesome. (laughs) I love it. Well, thank you, Ben. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. um, We'll see you soon. Want more? Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com where you can subscribe to my information-packed and entertaining newsletter and click the link up on the right-hand side of that webpage that says Ben Recommends where you'll see a full list of everything I've ever recommended to enhance your body and your brain. Finally, to get your hands on all of the unique supplement formulations that I personally develop, you can visit the website of my company, Keon, at getkion.com. That's getkion.com.